Gordenda. I hope I said that right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Iceland. I just arrived this morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, one small correction, I'm a former Deputy Assistant Secretary. I did serve uh, in our Energy Resources Bureau uh, at the uh, State Department, and it's it's been tremendous. It was a fairly new bureau focused on energy diplomacy, energy transformation, as well as how we can look at energy programs worldwide. Uh, so it's been a tremendous effort. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about energy security. Uh, but I, I, again, I just want to give a big thanks, though, to uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this, as well as the conference committee members. This is looking this morning to see how much of an attendance we've had today regionally coming in uh, to talk about such an important area for an energy resource is, is tremendous. Uh, you know, nine times out of ten, it's considered to be this um, forgettable uh, renewable source, and I hope today we'll, we'll be a little bit more um, enlightened by how uh, mainstream this can be. So the IEA actually defines energy security as an uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. That's the actual definition. But I would also like to add to that definition, clean and sustainable. In the United States, we see access to affordable, reliable, clean, and secure supplies of energy as a fundamental national security concern. And really, this is for every country around the world. Energy shortages, price volatility, supply destructions anywhere can threaten economic growth everywhere. The markets are truly interconnected. So energy security is not something that can be achieved alone. It is important to work with our international partners around the world to promote global energy security and economic growth, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a true fundamental component of national security. To be energy secure includes engagements with major energy producers, consumers, transit states, the private sector as well as the public sector to truly advocate for energy security and particularly energy security of the international community. In Europe, for example, energy security is a top priority as many countries are dependent um, on one single supplier for gas imports, for example. If you look back in 2015, 35% uh, of total European gas imports came from one supplier. Russia. And 13 European countries were dependent on Russian gas to meet more than 75% of their annual gas imports. In some cases, that percentage was even higher. Many of these countries view the dependence as a national security threat and are working to diversify their energy infrastructure in a variety of different ways. And that is the ultimate key to energy security today, diversification. If anything, today, I, I hope you can take that key theme away with you, because to diversify the energy mix in support of its national security is what will move, help move the needle forward. So I've traveled all around the world throughout Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, where I've met a number of foreign ministers, energy ministers, national uh, companies, uh, executives, really to try to underscore our partners' efforts um, to try to promote this energy security. And so this energy security, um, as mentioned, was agreed by all that it can only be achieved through that real diversification. And that includes energy source, energy type, and energy route. And that's why we support renewable energy, because obviously, as we know, it's clean, it's affordable, it's reliable, it's safe. And that can advance the key to the, that diversification principle. Now, as we look into the electricity sector, for example, we're uh, supporting the Baltic states um, as they work with the European Commission to try to synchronize their grid uh, with the European Union's electricity grid and working closely with countries like Poland or, or Finland to try to realize this goal. So I think it's quite clear that when you look at the benefits of diversification, it's truly undeniable. Um, another example uh, is Lithuania, where I recently traveled, and they're you know, trying to liberal, liberalize their gas market. And it's constructed its own floating LNG terminal. And this provided actually the first means for a non-Russian supply of power to the Baltic states. 
So it also compelled a national company like Gazprom to try to play by free market rules because Lithuania was able to import from other sources and prices eventually went down. So again, another example of how it's so important to diversify those energy resources and working regionally and globally, such as with our European countries partners as one example uh, to promote energy security and help strengthen that national security and our transatlantic partnerships. But of course, this goes way beyond um, you know, Europe. This is, this is certainly something that we have to look at globally. Um, in the United States, which I'll speak of, we do have this all of the above energy strategy where we reaffirm our commitment to renewable energy and all the clean energy technologies. Now, as we've examined, if you look at the second half of 2017, it's safe to say that renewable energy along with natural gas and nuclear was a key component of the modern electricity system. The market for renewable energy technologies, however, is vast, it is global, and it is growing rapidly. In the past three years, we have seen renewables reach an unprecedented level of investment. Around 340 million, uh, I'm sorry, billion supported 147 gigawatts globally of new renewable generation capacity, the largest annual increase ever. This was the first year that renewable energy investment surpassed investment in all other forms of energy production. In 2016, we saw more of the same. However, because of the dramatically declining prices, we were able to buy more for less money. And so if you look at the dollar of investment in 2016, it went from 33% further than in the year previous. And with $288 billion supporting another 161 gigawatts of new capacity. So renewable energy then became the single largest source of new infrastructure investment over the past two and a half years. Now many have attributed the dramatic increase in renewable energy to the mitigation efforts on climate change. And that is absolutely correct. Let me be clear. There is a linkage, linkage between renewable market dynamics and climate change. And when the world came together for the Paris Agreement, it was partly fueled by that dramatically decreasing prices in renewable energy, which made renewable energy adoption and the increased use of low carbon, zero carbon emitting technologies to really take hold. And those investment trends continue. Furthermore, there are consistent and new dynamics that are moving the renewable energy markets forward. The first one is the technological advances, which we heard a little bit about this morning. There's been an increase in R&D, research and development investment in renewables as well as energy efficiency. And over the last six years or so, we've seen dramatic increases in the cost of solar and wind across the board to the point where wind turbines and solar panels have also been cost effective and in some cases competitive with power generated by either coal or gas. So at this point, the trend is undeniable and the markets have spoken. Renewable energy is a trend that will continue to endure. The second reason that is quite motivating and increasing the embrace of renewable energy is tied to energy security, which I mentioned earlier. All too often we've seen energy used as a geopolitical weapon with major suppliers seeking to exert geopolitical leverage over their consumers. Again, one only need to look at, as an example, Russia's use of its natural gas supply to Ukraine and Europe, as well as looking at Venezuela at its petro diplomacy, if you will, to gain political influence in the Caribbean basin to see the impacts that energy vulnerability has. And of course, the only way to try to combat these vulnerabilities is through a diversified energy portfolio. A diverse energy portfolio, portfolio using the entire matrix of energy supplies, the all, all of the above strategy, it's not a zero sum game here or competition, it's more about securing that d diverse energy portfolio. So renewables and efficiency are certainly a key component of that in, in an attempt to increase that diversity um, and therefore ensuring security at home and in the region. Now another reason why renewable energy markets are expanding rapidly is energy access. We heard earlier today over a billion people in the world today lack access to energy services and many of these people live in remote areas. In fact, about 90% of those without energy access live in those remote areas. And if we were to try to rely on conventional fuel sources, for example, those 90% would most likely not receive that access to energy. So 
as we see this increase and this diversity, as I mentioned earlier, that truly comes in multiple kinds of business models, uh, as well as finance models, uh, they are starting to reach the rural population and thus seeing a boom in this renewables, especially empowering home systems to include mini grid systems around the world. In fact, just two years ago, we saw renewable mini-grid markets grow to $200 billion market. That's a pretty sizable economic market. And those in the private sector, those here today um, that I spoke to earlier in the audience, understands that this is as well, if not better, than governments. We've seen a huge spike in corporate procurements, uh, corporations, large companies worldwide committing to 100% renewable energy portfolio. And they do this for a number of reasons. It is used to be, I'm sorry, it used to be where companies would adopt renewable energy out of a sense of corporate sustainability or, or a corporate responsibility, a feel good thing. Uh, but now it has truly become a business case. Uh, in the US, for example, clean energy and renewable energy employs almost 3 million people. Bloomberg New Energy Finance projects that building new wind and solar projects will become cheaper than operating existing fuel fo fossil fuel plants by the end of the next decade. So uh, just to sum up, it is clear that we are far beyond the point of being green that is cost effective to actually cost efficient. It is a profit profitable enterprise for producers as well as consumers. And in fact, the IEA also projects that renewables will account for two thirds of all power generation investment from now until 2040. That's more than seven trillion dollars market potential over the next 22 years. Much of this market lies outside the United States and much of it is in developing countries. So through these programs, there are partnerships with key countries uh, trying to accelerate and enhancing these uh, existing global trends. Uh, the factors that drive these trends, again, technology innovation, economic prosperity, national and regional security. Those are the forces that are driving renewable energy. So let me now hone in to why we're here today. Let's talk about that forgettable renewable. Let me ask everyone here today, how can green technology secretly become mainstream? It goes underground. All right, a little ch chuckle in the audience there, just kidding, but seriously, um, because geothermal technology is silent and invisible, most people don't realize how well established this technology is. You might be surprised by its popularity, but then again, by the mere attendance here today, I see more than ever that this secret has been out for quite some time. So how mainstream is geothermal? I mean, there's been over one million home installations in the United States is one example. And unlike solar energy or wind power, there is no big noticeable above ground screaming, I'm green technology, look at me. Geothermal power generation is a well-established and relatively mature form of commercial rene renewable energy. One of its important characteristics, as many of you know, is high load factor, which means that each megawatt of capacity produces significantly more electricity during a year than a megawatt of either wind or solar capacity. Geothermal capacity grew to about 3.6%, that's about 440 megawatts, in 2016 to reach 13.4 gigawatts. The largest additions to capacity were in Indonesia and Turkey. The US has the largest geothermal capacity with about 3.6, and that's about 27% of the world total, followed by the Philippines 1.9 gigawatts and Indonesia 1.6 and New Zealand 1.0 at this point in time. So yes, geothermal power runs at a much higher uh, load factor than wind and solar. Its energy source is continuous rather than intermittent. So again, geothermal produces sig significantly more electricity per megawatt of capacity. However, some would say the geological conditions required for geothermal power means that development has been more concentrated in relatively small number of countries, and we can certainly talk about that a little bit later. So while geothermal power generation grew that, through that 3.6% in 2016, it appears overall, however, the geothermal share of global power generation still remains very small. We're looking at about 0.3%. But in certain countries, it still does play in a significant role, particularly in Kenya, uh, which is about 44% of power, Iceland, 27% and more, 
El Salvador, 26, and New Zealand, 18%. And again, according to the IEA, global geothermal power capacity is expected to rise almost 17 gigawatts by 2021, with the biggest capacity additions expected in, again, Indonesia, Turkey, the Philippines, as well as Mexico. A colleague from California said to me once, think of renewable energy as a house. Solar is the roof and wind is the walls, but geothermal is the foundation. And what California, as an example, did is built these walls and, these, and, and this roof, but whenever there was this crazy, you know, undetermined weather, windy days, it would blow off, you know, too much with the rain, uh, it would blow off the roof and, and the walls would fall down. So California decided to move forward on that, um, looking at the Salton Sea uh, as an opportunity to build on geothermal. And we have some of the largest capacity now in Nevada and Utah, as well as Hawaii. Now, in order to reach these targets, policymakers, local authorities, utilities need to be more aware of the variety of geothermal resources available and of their possible applications. There are various roadmaps, again, which we'll hear a little bit later today and tomorrow, that will be discussed uh, throughout the conference and we'll describe the technological, the economic, and the non-economic barriers facing the uh, geothermal deployment and the steps stakeholders must take to overcome them. But in the end, there must be this shared goal on geothermal to be able to provide that framework for international cooperation, particularly in R&D. This includes information sharing, developing best practices on the use of those technologies and the technique, exploration, development, and producing and disseminating analysis as well as databases. And again, the IEA, and I know that Irina has been working on this too, has built a team together with a number of contracting parties that include Iceland and Mexico. And some of those activities include advanced drilling and logging technologies, uh, data collection and information, deep roots of volcanic geothermal systems, direct use of geothermal energy, enhanced ge geothermal systems, which we'll hear more about, the environmental impacts, as well as induced seismicity. I uh, also want to mention the U.S. Department of Energy. Right now, uh, they're also spending a lot of time and energy in something called the FORGE Project, which stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal. And it's basically dedicated, uh, it's a dedicated site where scientists and engineers uh, are able to develop and test um, and, and further accelerate any type of breakthroughs in these enhanced geothermal systems or EGS technologies and techniques. Uh, currently, right now, the proposed test sites are in a Nevada that's run by the Sandia National Laboratories, as well as uh, at the University of Utah, where uh, researchers plan to try to experiment uh, with these new geothermal technologies. So it's a very exciting time. And the idea is if they can make enhanced geothermal systems a reality, then geothermal energy production around the country would skyrocket. So you have the new technology and the demand for a diversified and clean energy uh, will really bring this forgotten renewable, I think, to the forefront of clean power, as well as what I mentioned earlier, the theme of making sure uh, with that diversified portfolio that will achieve energy security. So I very much look forward to your questions and an interactive dialogue, and I thank you again for having me here today.